Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Green Alliance webinar. I'm Libby Peak, Head of Resource Policy here at Green Alliance, and I'll be guiding us through the next hour-long discussion that seeks to answer the question, why is the government ignoring behaviour change as a climate solution? Now, before I hand over to our expert panel, just a few bits of context from me and some thoughts on why the government shouldn't be ignoring behaviour change as a climate solution. And it's, it's really quite simple. If they're to stand any chance of meeting their legally binding net zero target, they can't afford to ignore it. And as a quick and, and quite brief aside, um, but I think an important one, I think it's worth remembering that the legally binding target only actually covers the emissions that are produced within the UK's borders and not those that are produced overseas and are associated with the, the products we purchase and the goods that we consume, which are about 50% higher again. So actually changing behavior and especially reducing consumption here in the UK could have a bigger impact on tackling global climate change than we often realize or talk about or the government is targeting. But just sticking with the government's legally binding targets for the moment, the Committee on Climate Change has estimated in its initial net zero assessment that actually only 38% of the changes that are needed to reach net zero will come exclusively from technological change and low and no carbon energy. And while only 9% will come purely from society, societal or behavior changes, the remaining majority, 53%, will actually require a combination of technological and societal changes. So this makes it all the more of a shame that the vast majority of efforts so far has gone into decarbonizing energy production and relatively little attention has gone into encouraging and enabling the behavior changes needed to complement those shiny technologies, that hard hattery that is so favored by politicians. It's notable that in Green Alliance's most recent net zero policy tracker, we found that the only sector that has a majority of confirmed policy in place to deliver against its net zero targets is the power sector, where 81% of the needed emission reductions <clears throat> are in confirmed policy. And to put that in perspective, the next nearest sector is heat and buildings at only 31%. And if you look at transport, which is the highest emitting sector and is the one is one where you're obviously going to need a combination of, uh, of technological change as well as societal adoption, only 7% of the emissions reductions are in place there. Um, and the vast majority are either tied up in consultations or haven't been dreamed up yet. So as you can imagine, this is something that we're quite concerned about at Green Alliance. Um, and that we consider in various projects, including our Transform Tax Project, which is funded by the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust, and which seeks to determine how the tax system can be better used to encourage people and businesses to make the environmentally friendly choices that we know that they want to make. And our first speaker today is going to touch on that in just a moment. He's Max Templar, Research Director at Thinks Insight and Strategy, the consultancy formerly known as Britain Thinks who led the work for us on public attitudes to greening the tax system. We'll also be joined by Aaron Advani, who's Associate Professor in Economics at U the University of Warwick uh, and a Research Fellow at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, amongst many other roles too numerous to mention. We'll then be joined by Toby Park, who leads the energy and sustainability work at the Behavioral Insights Team, the original nudge unit. Um, and last, but by no means least, we'll hear from Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, an environmental psychologist and director of the ESRC-funded UK Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformation. Before I hand over the screen to our expert panellists, just a tiny bit of housekeeping for me. You'll see that we have the chat and the Q&A open. So if you want to react to things that the speakers are saying or chat amongst yourselves, um, please do that in the chat function. But if you have a, a, a question that you'd like the panellists to answer and we have quite a few people on the call today so I imagine there will be plenty of questions please do put that in the Q&A um, but with that we're ready to kick off we're ready to get started um, so I'm going to turn to Max first and Max the, the work you did for Green Alliance's Transform Tax Projects showed a few things quite clearly first of all that people are very concerned about the environment that they want the government to lead and to help them do the right thing and that they're surprisingly open to the idea of greening the tax system provided certain conditions are met. Can you talk us through some of the findings in a bit more detail and, and also update us on the recent related research you're doing on the cost of living? Sure thing, uh, thanks Libby. Um, so yes, just to kind of give a very brief intro. Um, so this is, I'll be talking through some of the findings from a piece of work that we did on greening the tax system that was conducted in the summer of 2021. Uh, it was a mixed methods piece of work. So we had a quantitative 
element with a nationally representative sample, what that really gives you is a strong sense of those spontaneous views where people start from. And that was accompanied then by some deliberative work, um, which was taking people through some of the more some of the detail and getting their informed views and, and those considered views that, that perhaps I think most people don't have a strong understanding of the tax system uh, spontaneously. So, so that's why it's really important. Um, as, as Libby mentioned, quite a lot has changed uh, since 2021. So, uh, and key amongst that is that the cost of living now is much higher. Um, that's something that I'll return to um, later on, but I just wanted to flag. So in terms of those key findings from the, that piece of work, um, the first one, um, and, and to set the context, so back in 2021, we saw a third of the public saying that climate change and the environment was a top three priority for them. Um, and we saw then in the deliberative, so in the jury, this is jury aspect of the work, um, they described that as something that had become more important to them over recent years. They talked about wanting something to be done. They acknowledged that they had some responsibility for, for taking action themselves, but knowledge about what they could do, what they should do was quite low. Uh, and, and they acknowledged that. The second key finding then was that a, a slim majority of the public said that they want the tax system to be uh, transformed. Um, what we saw in the delib though is that jurors held many negative associations with the current tax regime. They tend to see it as unfair and, and ineffective. Um, but we saw more broadly then some skepticism that successful tax reform could be delivered. So there is a kind of a challenge there in communicating about this to the public. Third key finding was that around three in five of the public supported using the tax system to make environmentally damaging behaviours more expensive, but also to make environmentally beneficial uh, behaviours um, less expensive. So both of those being important. Um, and, and, and what we saw with the jury is that they supported um, kind of green taxes, but they had they developed a kind of a set of principles that they felt were very important. Uh, those principles were around, firstly, the visibility of the tax and why they're paying it. They don't want it to be a stealth tax, something that they're not aware of. And in part, that's because they think that in order for it to act as an effective uh, kind of behavior change mechanism people need to be aware of the mechanism and therefore essentially what the rules are they're playing by um, they also um, wanted to cover kind of the transparency so they wanted to know where the money is being spent what it's being spent on and ideally they'd like it to be spent on um, things related to the environment a really important principle was fairness and they talked about that in terms of having a viable alternative to, to behavior. So what they don't want, didn't want to see was taxes that made it more expensive to do behaviors which they just couldn't avoid doing. Uh, a key example of that might be if you're living in a rural location with poor public transport, they didn't want to be paying more tax uh, for driving when they had no other kind of viable alternative to, for, for transport. So that's a kind of key principle there. Uh, and then the, the final one being the effectiveness of actually changing behaviour. So they wanted, they were far more concerned with the taxes being, green taxes being used to, used as a behaviour change mechanism, rather than being used as a, a way to kind of bring income into the tax pot. Of the things that we tested, green VAT was, was the most popular uh, proposal um, that was based on the kind of perception that it was probably going to be the easiest to implement um, and it would also lead to a clear reduction in costs so to that point about making some things more expensive and some things cheaper they felt that the green VAT could be used in that way um, as we mentioned we've also been doing research on the cost of living and people's experiences of that um, and last summer we we prompted the public with um with some environmentally beneficial behaviours, um, but which had been influenced or impacted um, by cost of living increases and energy price rises, um, which in some ways acts as a bit of a kind of natural experiment for how do people respond to price incentives. And unsurprisingly, we saw that people claimed they had reduced uh, their kind of energy consumption in a variety of ways. To that point of fairness, though, and I think a really important one to, to mention, is, is that the people who are most likely or were most likely to say that they had kind of taken those energy conserving behaviors 
they were the people who were struggling the most financially and felt that way. So to that point of fairness, there's a, it's an important kind of contextual point. I think the final thing I'd say in relation to cost of living um, here is, is just that the other kind of broad impact here is that people may feel that they have less leeway to, um, to take on increased costs in the context of, of, of kind of all of their costs rising, which I think is an important point when considering this. Um, so Thanks very much, Max. I, I, I mean, I, I was really pleased with that piece of work, and I think the, the evidence was quite compelling. But obviously, there are, there are many factors that are needed to, to get things right. Um, and as you say, one of the main concerns that came out of the work was that the changes had to be fair. <clears throat> so I'm going to turn to um, Aaron now and, say, and, and note that despite this compelling evidence, the government remains wary of making changes that would drive better environmental behaviours if the changes could be labelled either as nanny state interventions uh, or as regressive. So can you talk us through what are the most important things to bear in mind um, when designing taxes to ensure that they're fair, that they don't harm the least well off, and therefore that they're more acceptable to the public? Yeah, thanks, Libby. And it, and it was really, um, really interesting to hear those the results from Max and, and, and have him pick out some of those kind of key concerns that the public have. Uh, I mean, I think the core of this is that ultimately, if you want uh, to use taxes for behaviour change, the whole idea is that you are making some things more expensive and therefore discouraging people from doing them and potentially making some things cheaper and encouraging people to do them. So we want to increase the tax on things that are high in carbon and other greenhouse gas greenhouse gas emissions uh, and reduce the cost of, of alternatives uh, and so that fairness piece looks like both you know fairness across businesses and and across households there's there's those important uh, dimensions to think about uh, the fairness piece for households really looks like two things the first is thinking about how do you compensate them for those higher costs that they, they are facing so as max mentioned the current uh, rise in in gas prices has led to a reduction in demand it's led to people uh, spending less on on um, on gas heating their homes reducing some of their electricity consumption um, but that's been driven by the fact that people actually can't afford to uh, and so one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that People aren't being squeezed in a way that they are making those trade-offs that we've sometimes seen in the newspapers around, you know, affording to heat their home or affording to eat. Uh, so we need to find a way in which, as alongside raising those taxes that, that keep gas costs high, for example, which they unfortunately need to be high, that money that's raised if it's coming through the tax system is money that can be used uh, to redistribute partly uh, towards those particularly low-income households uh, who are going to struggle. And so we did some work a few years ago uh, looking at that. Uh, and showing that you can compensate some of the losers, some of the people who will be worse off and who are also on low incomes uh, by doing that. But the second part is you actually can't compensate them all. And a big part of the reason for that is that there's also very different costs for, for example, heating your home, depending on the quality of the accommodation you live in. And so the second part of, of what fairness for households looks like uh, really is around making sure that alongside cash compensation, there's also support for things like retrofit. Uh, because those are areas where actually the upfront costs can be very high, even if the long term uh, kind of benefit uh, overall makes it worthwhile. So it might be that replacing that gas boiler uh, with, a, with a heat pump uh, is actually effective and pays off over some number of years for a household. But actually the upfront cost of replacing the, the boiler is too high uh, for them to be able to afford. And so thinking about that is another part of the other part of fairness is maybe using some of that. Uh, cash to actually support that retrofit and um, we actually saw uh, last summer that Bayes was proposing back when it existed was proposing something like that it unfortunately got turned down by the treasury um, but something like that is, is a second important part of fairness on the business side there's also the need to think about uh, you know which businesses uh, need additional support uh, as you increase those costs and the main the main area there is around uh, thinking about international competition so it was mentioned already uh, that we already consume a lot of carbon from other countries and in a way one of the risks of increasing production costs in the UK uh, is this issue of uh, maybe us offshoring more of our carbon emissions and so an important part of that is thinking about how to not only be providing support on the on the household side but on the business side on the business side I think the key thing is to think about something like a carbon border adjustment that's one of the things that we're now uh, able to do with our you know post brexit freedoms and um, but to think about a carbon border adjustment uh, that would allow us to uh, tax imports that are uh, high in carbon but come from countries that don't have uh, carbon taxes themselves and potentially to reduce the cost for the exporters so that they're not facing higher costs when they're sold in another country relative to, to what our competitor has. Then the final thing just to say in fairness is this is focused, you know, what I've said so far has been focused very much on the here and now, uh, 
the big picture to remember always is that the, the fundamental question of fairness in, in terms of the climate is an intergenerational one. You know, us not bearing some of those costs now is imposing costs on future generations. And that's not something that will get picked up uh, automatically. It's not something that we see automatically in voting behavior. Um, but it is something that's really important for us to bear in mind. And that's why it's important uh, that we uh, do some of those policies now that raise costs now, but figure out a way to be fair to people within the current generation so that we're not just instead postponing those costs and imposing them on, on future generations. Uh, so I'll hand over back to Libby. Thanks very much, Erin. Um, there's a lot to think about there. And actually, you'll be pleased to hear that the next output for the Transform Tax project is going to be considering issues of, of carbon pricing and, and border adjustments uh, and setting out our views on that. Um, but actually, go, going back and picking up on some issues around taxes and carbon taxes around meat and things like that, I'm going to turn to, to Toby and, and observe that your recent report, How to Build a Net Zero Society, demonstrated again that people were surprisingly up for greening the tax system and that more than half, half the people supported a, a carbon tax on meat, which I found really quite surprising. But looking beyond taxes, what are the other key things that government should be doing to help people make the environmentally friendly decisions we know they want to make? Yes, thank you very much. I mean, it's a big question and there's lots of ways we could answer that. I think maybe one one simple approach is a mnemonic we like to use. Uh, EAST, go EAST, stands for easy, attractive, social and timely. Uh, so really what it's saying is if you want to encourage green behaviours, make those behaviours easy, attractive, social and timely. So for example, one powerful way of making behaviours easy is to default it. So what happens if people just go with the flow, don't make a proactive choice, but just sort of go with the, the default outcome? So, for example, some nice studies in Germany and Switzerland have shown that defaulting people into uh, green energy tariffs led to a roughly 10 times increase in the number of people on those tariffs, as well as, by the way, slightly increased um, customer satisfaction. Uh, we can use defaults in a range of situations, of course. We've just done a nice piece of work uh, where we defaulted people into smaller portion sizes within hotel canteens. And of course, they remain the freedom to ask for more or to go back for seconds. But by having a bit less on your plate to begin with, that cut food waste by around 45%. Um, we can also think about making things attractive. So one way to do that is simply to think carefully about the framing that we use. How do we talk about uh, an issue or behavior? Are we implicitly or explicitly sort of elevating the co-benefits and the positives associated with that behavior rather than just the compromises and the abstemiousness that is sometimes attached to green behaviors? Uh, so for example, we ran an experiment where we were asking people whether they would choose a heat pump in the next five years over a gas boiler. Um, and we found that talking about the heat pump in terms of increased energy security and getting off of um, volatile gas prices, or in terms of increased house value, or indeed just addressing some common myths around the performance of heat pumps and assuring people that they would work well in their home, all of those things were significantly more effective at driving, um, in this case, hypothetical uptake uh, compared to emphasizing the environmental benefits of heat pumps, for example. Um, of course, another big part of making behavior attractive is incentives and tax design. So I'll come back to that in a moment, given that's a, a key focus for today. Uh, how do we make behavior social? Well, it's important that we make green behaviors as visible and transparent and noticeable as possible to other people so that they can more naturally kind of spread through that process of social contagion, social influence. So that's exactly why, for instance, in the UK, we have green number plates. Uh, on electric vehicles so that non-EV drivers might start to notice them as becoming increasingly uh, common on the roads and therefore perhaps be slightly more likely to think, oh, okay, maybe there's something in them, maybe I should check them out, maybe my next car will be an EV. Um, we also find that solar panels are, are literally contagious uh, in the sense that um, if you live in a street with more solar panels, you are more likely uh, to, to consider adopting them yourself. Um, and then finally, how can we make behaviors more timely? Well, one key way we can do that is simply by encouraging behavior change at key moments of change. So for instance, a piece of work we ran in the US, we found that encouraging people to take up a new cycle share scheme was four times more effective when we targeted new home movers as compared to people who already lived in the area. Uh, so moving home is of course the moment when your transport habits are disrupted anyway. Uh, and so it's a precious opportunity to get in there and encourage um, new, new habits. Uh, on incentive and tax design specifically, I'm not a tax expert, but um, obviously designing incentives is a big part of behavioral science and behavioral economics. Just a couple of points I would mention there. 
Firstly, um, I guess a broad point, incentives generally have psychological dimensions to them as well as sort of purely economic uh, workings. So a nice example of that in the UK is a plastic bag levy, where yes, there's an incentive attached to the, to the use or disincentive attached to the use of a plastic bag, but it also acts as quite a strong default because now you have to proactively ask for one rather than just picking one up or being given one. Uh, it acts as a prompt, a reminder. People generally know they shouldn't be using plastic, but having to pay that 10 pence or that 20 pence is quite a salient reminder. So if we can crowd in these psychological benefits with incentives, uh, they will tend to work better. Secondly, incentives can of course be designed to face the consumer, um, but also they can be designed to face more upstream actors like retailers, producers, manufacturers, and so on. So a key, I guess, sort of poster child example of that would be the sugar levy in the UK, which was very much designed to encourage reformulation uh, among producers rather than as a sort of classic syntax to discourage consumption of sugary drinks. And it had the desired effect. And what that means, of course, is that the what we call the choice environment or the choice architecture that consumers faced uh, is now far less sugar intensive. And so they don't necessarily need to feel like they're proactively changing their behavior in response to an incentive if we can get the action to happen further upstream. Um, and then thirdly, I would say both upfront and long-term costs matter to consumers. So we want to think about exactly where we place the incentive and they can also reinforce each other. Uh, so for example, a, an experiment we ran on heat pump adoption, um, we ran an online experiment, again, hypothetical choice, uh, but with 8,000 people making over 24,000 discrete choices where we were offering them a choice between a heat pump at either 5,000 or 10,000 pounds as compared to a gas boiler at 2,000 pounds. What we found is that reduction in cost from five uh, from 10 to 5,000 pounds, that led to a significant increase in hypothetical uptake of 10 percentage points, uh, but also making it slightly cheaper to run. So tweaking, in other words, the gas versus electricity price so that heat pumps were say 20 pounds a month cheaper than a gas boiler to run versus 20 pounds a month more expensive. That also led to a big, uh, a big increase of seven percentage points. But when you combine those two things, you don't get 17%, you get 31 percentage points. So there's an interaction effect there where, where actually, if it's cheap enough to run, people are more willing to pay a little bit up front, but not loads up front. And the math sort of works out more sensibly in people's minds. So we want to think about how those long term and upfront uh, incentives kind of interact in order to trigger the behavior. Great. Thanks very much for those thoughts. Um, if we want to get involved in a little bit of a policy geekery just now, I'd say that actually my, my favourite ever environmental policy is uh, the Eco Design Directive, um, which has sort of, without people noticing, just, well, with some people noticing and, and saying that we're going to have very um, dim houses and, and limp toast, notably in, in some of the right-wing media, um, in general, though, it has just led to improvements in, in products and how products function and the, the energy savings they deliver and in the savings to households. So it's saved the equivalent of 600,000 cars off the road in the UK, and the average household is saving more than £100 a year and probably more, much more, actually, now that the energy prices have gone up. And they've got better products. So it's, 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 a, it's a sort of policy approach that we know is possible in some ways, um, but we haven't got it everywhere. Um, and so I'm going to turn now to Lorraine, who, who will have some further thoughts on this and who has worked quite closely with a number of parliamentary select committees on a number of really important projects, including as one of the lead experts on the Climate uh, Assembly UK and as a specialist advisor in the, re the recent House of Lords inquiry into behaviour change for climate, which found quite categorically that government's approach is, quote unquote, seriously inadequate. So do you get the sense that there's any willingness to change approach to, to what more widely adopt those sorts of policies that we know will work and are the lessons we can learn from either other countries or other successful behavior change campaigns yeah thanks thanks libby uh, i guess the short answer is um not really um so the inquiry that you mentioned that the house of lords environment and climate change committee inquiry on behavior change for climate and environmental goals um last year got evidence from uh across government departments, um, uh, UK government departments. And one of the sort of mantras that came out of that was that their approach to behavior change was to go with the grain of consumer choice and that there wasn't an appetite to really intervene or to steer or to enable people to make low carbon choices. And yet we know that the way in which our society is structured at the moment, high carbon choices are often the easiest, cheapest, more natural, more sort of socially normal 
um, choice. So all of the kind of incentives, all of the sort of uh, all of the push really are towards higher carbon choices, at least in many cases. Um, so if the default is the sort of high carbon use, then inevitably we're not moving in the right direction. We're just pe pe people's behavior will naturally be um, higher carbon. So we really need government intervention um, if we're to reach our climate and environmental goals. And I think part of the reason that, that there might be this reluctance to intervene is, is ideological. And I think particularly maybe towards the right of centre politically, there is a, a lack of sort of willingness or desire to intervene within people's lives, within what businesses are doing. Um, but also, I think just more generally, there's probably there's perhaps an assumption that the public don't want to change their behaviour. And actually, we know that that's not right from from our polling, from lots of other polling. We know that actually the public are very concerned about climate change and they want to play their part in reaching net zero. They want, they're happy to change their behaviour, but they do need help to do that. So they do want the barriers to be removed. They do want it to be less costly, less uh, inconvenient and so on. Um, and so and they support many of the policies that would enable them to change their lifestyles to become lower carbon. So, for example, two thirds support a frequent flyer levy. Similar proportions would support policies that make high carbon products more expensive and low carbon products cheaper. So in effect, a sort of carbon tax and, and support for other sorts of regulations, incentives, et cetera, as well. So and, and I, the inquiry, the House of Lords inquiry found um, very few examples of where the government are currently going far enough on behaviour change um, to uh, support climate uh, targets. So one possible exception is around electric vehicles, where the uptake has been very substantial and, and more better than forecast. And that's partly due to some of the incentives, but also having a phase out date for um, internal combustion engines. So we know that we are having to move towards uh, electric vehicles. So there has been there has been a bit more kind of support for that technological shift, but in other areas around diet, energy, material consumption, adapting to climate impacts, there has been far far less, um, and the barriers remain, and there just hasn't been the progress. Um, we did find some examples of good practice from other countries, and so for example around energy, um, we heard evidence that in France they have a dedicated professional who comes and works with households that want to reduce their energy bills to analyze their their needs and help them find financial support and even put them in touch with local skilled um, tradespeople to actually install uh, energy efficiency measures so they're, they're really helped through that process of uh, reducing their, their energy consumption and installing um, efficiency measures something similar that the, the Scottish government is starting to, to roll out around a sort of one-stop shop for energy uh, support um, as well um, in the area of consumption, we found that there, there are some, some examples of um, good practice in France and Sweden. So in France, they have a product repairability index and a, the labeling there uh, is encourages uh, companies to kind of move up through from, from red or amber to, to green um, by making their products more repairable. Uh, in Sweden, they have, um, uh, and Austria, I think, they have uh, the, the labor costs um, are for repair are tax deductible. So they're incentives for me again for, for repairability. Transport, there are of course examples where countries have really high levels of walking, cycling, public transport, but that's after decades of investment in those options and an approach to urban design that prioritizes people and walkability or cyclability over car, car the more car-centered design. But we found examples also from health behavior change campaigns within the UK and elsewhere. So for example, um, COVID-19 and smoking were really good examples of where there was very substantial behavior change because of many of the things that Toby has mentioned. So they moved beyond just giving people information, which is often approached, let's just maybe put some labels on things or have an information campaign to educate people. But we know by itself, that tends not to be very effective to change behavior. And so the five a day campaign, for example, was one, one that came up in the inquiry as this is where we haven't seen uh, very much shift in behavior, despite there being lots of information encouraging people to increase their fruit and veg intake. Um, where where uh, 
where in the case of smoking and, and COVID, there were there were there was support to remove behaviour change barriers. There was very clear leadership, um, uh, people in the government actually standing up and very clearly uh, making it clear that there was a crisis in the case of COVID nineteen that, that everybody had to uh, change what they were doing. There was financial support to enable people to work from home. There was regulation that ensured that people did stick to the rules. Um, and there was a sequencing and a, and a combining of measures. So again, as, as Toby's mentioned, actually bringing together many different elements to create a package of uh, interventions to encourage and enable people to change their behaviour. So there's, I think there's a huge amount of insight into how to change behaviour, but currently um, it's, it's not being applied. Okay, well, at least we know what needs to be done and we've got options for, for driving forward things. I think before we open up to, to questions from the audience, and we've had some good ones come in already, I want to reflect a little bit more about um, the government and what's blocking things in government and pick up on a couple of things that, that, that you've said in your introductory remarks, um, including about how um, we need to have Toby's point about how we need to make it uh, attractive. And so that that implies to me we need to be talking about the benefits, the co-benefits of of looking into these sorts of things. But that's something that we know that for the most part, Treasury isn't interested in. And then, and then Aaron was also talking about how Treasury blocked some some measures that, that would have been helpful that Bayes had proposed. So I think I have a I have an overarching question about what do we need to do to change the behavior of Treasury? And is that realistic and, and how do we do it? Um, so if, if anyone has some thoughts, please do wave at me, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll just pick on Aaron first to, to come back and, and reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, it's an area I have strong views on. Um, I think it's hard. I mean, Treasury has a set of specific targets that they're set that are based on a five year scorecard. And so they look at things that pay off within that five years. And although some, thought is given to other issues i don't think the that everyone there is only fixed on five years the fact that that is specifically the target one of their targets and they don't have a target for well, what do things look like in 30 years time makes it much harder i mean political cycles always make it difficult to make decisions about the long term but i think it's also genuinely an issue that within the civil service the main target that they're given and therefore they work to is a five-year target so i think if you if you're serious about changing that it has to be the case that Treasury, Treasury specifically, rather than just across the civil service, have a set of targets that are based on long, a set of longer term goals and ambitions that aren't as as sort of, in some sense, generic as the as the ones in the Climate Change Act. Because I mean, those are those are basically the only other thing that gives us that long term view is that there's a requirement to make sure that we're consistent with that. Currently, we're not being consistent with that, but that's why it's being litigated um, because we're currently not meeting the the promises that we made according to that. Um, that's that's the kind of thing that we need is is, is targets that, that that force organizations like the Treasury to be think to have to think long term because that's the, the goal they're being required to fit to. And I think without that, it's going to be really really hard. Uh, but I think it will require therefore politicians to set those goals for the Treasury. I suppose there's a follow on question. Is, is there anything that we can be doing to make the co-benefits argument more attractive to to Treasury? I mean, I think that is certainly part of it, that, that we can uh, I mean, better evidencing what are the co-benefits is useful because they're always obviously having to do, do the cost benefit on these things and add things up. And there are lots of areas where there's uncertainty, genuine uncertainty. About, well, what are the effects? So the better the evidence based is that we can produce showing here what the other effects are that might not be in their basic modeling can help to say look actually this pays off more quickly than you think and therefore is, is more worthwhile but i think that is part of it is is really being able to provide that evidence base that they and that the obr can use when they're signing these things off to say actually the return on these things is very high uh, and that return is getting higher but i think there isn't yet completely a concrete way to factor in essentially here's the return on doing this investment now and, it, and sort of the cost of not doing it now is this further cost we're definitely going to have in the future and so we, ha we ought to factor that in I think that bit is as far as I'm aware not being factored in and it's kind of crucial in thinking about well how do you make that choice between now versus later exactly yeah I'm seeing some vigorous nodding from the other panelists uh, Toby or Lorraine do you want to come in with some comments on that before we move on I mean, I broadly agree. I think, you know, the Treasury specifically, of course, many of their decisions are going to be made on the basis of a cost benefit analysis, but of course, there's a, a discount rate applied to future benefits. And if there's a five year time window over which those benefits are being appraised, that's a big problem for our agenda here. Um, but also, as, as Aaron has says, I mean, you can obviously quantify the costs of implementing a policy to some extent. You can quantify the benefits of that policy 
um, albeit not all benefits tend to be measured if you look at the many co-benefits across society, but the costs of not acting can be quite hard to quantify and often those are the bits that really tip the scales massively in favour of action. So I think the more we can do to measure that and include that in the CBA, the better. Yeah, and I think actually just getting Treasury to start thinking about the environmental impacts of the tax system um, would be quite beneficial. There was a there was another public accounts committee report that was extremely damning about the Treasury saying that they they couldn't even say what the environmental impact of the, the tax system was. Um, they didn't even monitor the environmental impact of the very few things that are categorized as environmental taxes like landfill tax. And so there's clearly a cultural problem there that we need to move beyond. Um, and great that we have some ideas for doing it. Um, we, I'm going to turn now to some questions from the audience. Uh, and one, one of the one that's been getting a lot of support is, is a question of what actually is the extent of behavior change that is needed. Um, so obviously that we've got, we cited, I cited those figures from the CCC at the start saying that we need 9% of, uh, of, of um, net zero emissions reductions are going to be to come purely from societal and behavioral change and then 53% from a combination, but I guess that doesn't really illustrate what is needed in terms of behavior change. Um, so I'll come to Lorraine to set that out. Yeah, so I, I always think um, it, the, the, the report that I've seen that's most helpful, it comes from the, the Hot or Cool Institute. So about a year or uh, so ago, they looked across different um, uh, a load of different countries to see what the average carbon footprint was and where that carbon footprint needs to be if we're to if we're to have a chance of having only 1.5 degrees uh, warming and the average uk carbon footprint is eight and a half tons of co2 uh, per person per year um, and where we need to be is two and a half tons um, and by the way that's by 2030 uh, so that's like a, a colossal change uh, in, in a few years basically and obviously different countries like the the, the scale of behavior changes um varies considerably um, and even within countries so that's an average for the UK but we know for example that income is one of the biggest predictors of carbon footprint so people with very high incomes would have to come down an awful lot more to get to two and a half uh, tons whereas people on lower incomes um, much less so. Maybe. Thanks I'm, I happen to have a slide open from a presentation that kind of summarizes the key changes if people are interested. So, I mean, first thing to say, Libby, at the beginning, you mentioned that 38% um, stat from the Climate Change Committee that only 38% of the changes required are more sort of supply side and don't depend on behavioral change. The other 62% do depend on behavior change. I would argue that even that 38% has behavioral and social dimensions to it because it pertains to things like energy infrastructure, where of course there's issues of public consent and so on. Um, so actually I think behavior defined very broadly um, is kind of interwoven with the whole agenda. Um, but just specifically, you know, there's a huge number of changes that we'll be expected to make over the coming 30 years. So widespread adoption of heat pumps, target is 600,000 per year from 2028 and then increasing thereafter. Obviously ban on fossil fuel boilers likely from 2035. Potential role for hydrogen, both in our vehicles and in our homes, but feasibility studies are still ongoing. Uh, to enable widespread adoption of heat pumps, we need more energy efficiency in our homes, so that's insulation, double glazing, etc. We're all going to have to accept smart meters, um, for those of us that haven't yet, as well as greater use of time of use tariffs, home energy storage, smart appliances potentially, etc. That's just energy. Transport, we've got uptake of electric vehicles, phasing out combustion vehicles from 2030 and hybrid from 2035. 9% uh, reduction in car use by 2035, called for by the CCC. Uh, having half of journeys in towns and cities um, traveled on foot, bike, active travel um, from 2030. So these are quite big changes. And then of course we've got diet change, more circular economy, reducing our food waste, better recycling, repair, reuse, et cetera, as well. So it kind of touches on almost every aspect of our consumer lives. Some of that of course will almost happen by dethrow through mandates, technology phase outs and so on. But quite a bit of it still depends on proactive engagement either to adopt technologies or to make sustained change, changes in our in our lifestyles where we can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just actually to, to pick up on, on some of that point and to return to my sort of one of my pet peeves about consumption emissions, which I talked about at the start. So 
Do, is there a particular problem in the UK with our levels of consumption? Because I, I, I have some, I mean, Lorraine, you, you just provided some pretty shocking stats about the, the average UK carbon footprint. Um, but just if we look at particular, particularly problematic pro uh, product streams that we know have a big carbon footprint overseas, like textiles and like electronics, in the UK, we actually consume a lot more than in lots of other countries. Um, so for electronics, we produce, we, we get through the second highest amount of electronic, we produce the second highest amount of waste in the world, second only to Norway, which I think is quite surprising, um, but more than in the US, more than in China. And if you look at textiles, again, we, we consume more than twice as much textiles as some of the European counterparts who we'd consider quite fashionable, uh, including in Italy and, and the Netherlands. Um, so is there a particular problem in the UK with how we approach consumption and what can what can be done about it, particularly by government, but by, by anyone? Uh, I'll take I'll take anyone's thoughts on how to solve that problem. I'm happy to offer a few thoughts on that. And I think there was a comment in the Q&A maybe earlier on, on this point or related to this point. I, have to admit, I wasn't aware that we were so bad on textiles. I was aware we were terrible on electronics. Um, I think in my mind, this is where I tend to make a distinction between sort of downstream behaviors, what consumers can do in their day-to-day -day lives through agency and the ability to make direct changes to their behaviors, where of course we can, you know, we can all make more effort to repair more to buy second hand to throw away less and so on or to do do with less sometimes um but i think ultimately we are to some extent products of a kind of commercial system um within which it's actually quite hard to make significant impacts and changes alone uh, and so re realistically you know we cannot continue to live in a world in which it is far cheaper and more convenient to replace something than it is to get it repaired uh, we cannot continue to live in a world in which it is so unnecessarily complicated to recycle things um, and so on and so forth. So, and of course, circular business models are quite rare and hard to come by. If you want a upgradable or modular appliance, where are you going to go and how much of a premium are you willing to pay for it? So in my mind, it, it does require regulation kind of more upstream facing towards um, manufacturers, um, potentially retailers. There are some promising changes coming down the pipeline. I think there is a right to repair bill, as you'll no doubt be aware. But uh, and so this essentially um, you know, obligates manufacturers to, to have sort of repairability built into their into their appliances. And so on. my concern is that the details really, really matter here. Um, unless we strictly control uh, the way that these repair services are priced, then of course manufacturers could just overcharge for spare parts and repair services and so on, thus continuing the incentive as it is now that you just replace instead of repair. So uh, I think we need a suite of sort of regulations and policies that are more sort of up, upstream, more facing towards um, uh, manufacturers and so on to undo what is essentially an unhealthy commercial incentive for profligate consumption and waste. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just on the right to repair, so the, the government has brought in some eco-design standards from the EU that the EU originally developed that have some repair requirements, but they're, they're largely targeted um, at professional repairers and not, not at people who, would, who are the ones that want the right to repair, and they don't contain any sort of um, requirements about price. Um, and I would say that the we we have seen that it, it is possible that that the the EU is thinking more about that and the French repairability index that Lorraine mentioned at the start that actually does include price as one of the requirements um, in terms of spare part uh, spare part costs to make sure that that's factored in as well because obviously it's it's far too expensive at the moment and and you need to drive that down if you're go, going to get people to actually do the repairs the repairs that are technically possible. I'll come to Max who's got some thoughts. Yeah, I was just going to um, kind of firstly echo what, what Toby was saying about the recognizing the choices that are available uh, to people and, and thinking about both in this piece of research, but when we do this this type of uh, this type of research, ask people about acceptability of different, different things, they are often kind of quite acutely aware of the limitations that they um that they exist within so people talk about wanting to get things repaired I, I do quite a lot of research for example about people's attitudes to tech i think people would often really like to be able to get their their tech repaired rather than having to replace it but it simply isn't an option 
uh, a lot of the time or where it is an option to, to Toby's point it's not an, it's not a sensible option from an economic point of view it's often you could spend a lot of money getting something repaired um, and spend more than the value of just simply buying buying something new so I think that has implications both for the kind of behavior change side of things but thinking also about kind of public acceptability and the types of response that people are, are going to give to measures I think that's really important people don't and thinking about the responses to the green taxes that we saw they was real pushback against things that they thought would just hem them in give them additional costs but they didn't have an out for and I think that's going to be if, if this is an this is an important issue, but one where people really need those options. Otherwise, there's a risk that they just simply don't have legitimacy, the public. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to move on to some more um, more audience questions. We've had a few questions uh, about the fact that um, the place where behaviour change is needed, clearly needed more than anywhere else, is, is amongst the wealthy and the wealthiest in society with wealth, high wealth correlating to high carbon impact. So I suppose it'd be interesting to hear views on, on what needs to be done to, to tackle that aspect of the problem and to, to ensure that um, the wealthiest first address their really big impact. Um, I'll go to Aaron first. Yeah, so I, th I think it's absolutely right to say that people with high levels of income and high levels of wealth do consume more and do emit more. Um, I think there's, there's there's a couple of challenges in, in focusing too much on that, though. I think the first is the amount of tax you would need to put onto a wealthy person for them not to take, you know, if you're, if you're very wealthy, the kind of, are we really going to tax you enough that's actually going to change your behavior to make you not take that flight or not to do that thing? I mean, we could as a society decide that's what we want to do. I'm, I, I'm not here to say what we should or shouldn't do as a society, but you'd be thinking of very, very large levels of tax. Uh, if you were trying to kind of make a very wealthy person behave more like a, a, a not very wealthy person effectively. So either that's what we're trying to do, or we're saying what we're going to do is to still try to change that behavior, but by increasing those costs in the way we do for everybody else. The other thing is, although certainly, absolutely, we should remember that, that wealthy people do disproportionately uh, produce carbon emissions, it isn't the case that sort of if we could just get the wealthy to change their behavior, that would solve the problem. So I think I'm always nervous about people who kind of want to focus on that and say, okay, well, there are these wealthy people who definitely fly more than most of us definitely kind of have bigger cars or multiple cars that aren't particularly aimed at being uh, kind of efficient or whatever it is. But it's also the case that like if we got all of them to change their behavior tomorrow, we still have a lot for the rest of us to do. And so I don't think we shouldn't look at that, but I think it's important to remember that actually, if we're really going to hit our, if we're serious about our climate goals, and again, this is where we have to remember that intergenerational fairness thing, that it's not just about fairness between people now, but it's also between now versus later, but for our kids, our grandkids. If we're going to achieve that, we really do have to take actions now that are going to affect all of us now. And then the thing that, the, for me, the way to think about this issue of wealthy versus not wealthy is less around, well, let's try to make them specifically fly a bit less so that we can fly a bit more or something like that. And more, let's make sure that when we think about how do we pay for the costs of the retrofit, when we think of how do we pay for supporting low income households who are going to face higher costs if we're making energy more expensive, when we, when we do those things, we make sure that overall the tax system puts more of the uh, kind of weight on the people who have the border shoulders and gets money from there to be able to redistribute for those other purposes. So taxing wealthier people slightly more to be able to afford to pay for retrofit, yes. Thinking that by taxing wealthy people more, we're going to get them to do most of the carbon reductions. I personally don't think that's really the, the place to start from. I could just maybe chip in. I mean, I think that's right. So I think if we accept that maybe economic measures are not going to necessarily be the best way to deal with it, but there might be, I mean, there are very radical solutions like thinking about completely overhauling income tax or limiting the amount of um, uh, work that people did. So we posed some of these suggestions, by the way, to the Climate Assembly UK. So we said we could all kind of maybe work fewer hours in the week work a four-day week but actually only be paid for working like a four-day week so which is in contrast to some of the four-day working week trials at the moment where you still get paid for five days and there, and that would work because if you have a less lower income then you have less money to spend on stuff and so a lower carbon footprint in theory um, and we talked about personal carbon allowances and so these tradable sort of carbon quotas that people could have 
these these were not particularly popular options amongst the public. They found them just, I think, a bit too radical and that and, and unworkable. Um, even though they would be arguably quite fair in some ways, because they would like significantly reduce the um pollution created by the, the wealthier and um and so on. But so so those are some of the more radical um options. But I suppose more generally, it's about making those low carbon options much more attractive as well, so that anybody on any income is then kind of encouraged towards those and disincentivized gradually to, to away from the higher carbon options. So some of that might be about the cost, the relative cost, but some of it is about just the attractive, the attractiveness, the convenience, et cetera, the, the normalness. As uh, So all of the East things that Toby's mentioned, if we can sort of build that into the design of um, behavior change interventions, then they work across uh, different levels of income. Okay, thanks very much. We, we've had a question um, related to conspiracy theories. And I think before I get to that actual question, um, I'll, I'll just observe that some people are obviously going to be more open to the idea that they need to change their behaviors or more willing to change their behaviors. Um, and on the related point from, from the audience, the, they, they'd like to know if they have any advice on dealing with conspiracy theories, uh, for example, around 15 minute cities. So, uh, so I'd say like, what should we do about those that are less willing to change their behaviors and those who have been influenced by perhaps um, unwelcome, untrue things that they're told about behavior, the need to change behavior and, the, and, and climate change? I'll go to Max first. Yes, yeah, thanks. Um, I've, I've done a, a fair bit of research on people who have all, all kind of essentially consider conspiracy theories. I think that it's um, worth just not treating, it's very tempting to treat these kinds of theories or, or beliefs in isolation. Um, and, and I think it's worth always kind of bearing in mind that they often come as part of a kind of broader package of beliefs, which it's quite, it could be, you know, it can be quite difficult to to unpick i think if you look at some of the things that people at those protests in oxford were saying they weren't just limited to kind of beliefs about ltns they were also thinking about kind of a much broader set of conspiratorial beliefs so i think that on on that issue um at an overarching level there, there is something about working out really effective interventions that help stop people going down the rabbit hole on on the, on that and not just kind of focusing solely on on on, on one issue because they often come as as, as part of a, a package of, of broader beliefs and that i think would require kind of working with social media companies um, and working out kind of working out testing interventions that will help reduce the spread of, of untrue um, beliefs and, and when it comes to those things it's really about stopping the spread it's stopping people from sharing them and and that involves then also reaching out not just to the most radicalized people who are really very difficult to unpick those beliefs but thinking about also the groups of people who are relatively low information and where some of these beliefs might confirm some of their general biases so a belief that government overstretches itself and that it's trying to reduce their liberty. If you believe that, then you might be more inclined to believe this. And it's not really actually about the environment, the thing that you're pushing back against. It's about your broader beliefs about, about government. And so working out interventions which help reduce people from sharing that so it gets less pick up in the first place, um, I think is, is going to be the key thing there and working so, and these beliefs broadly spread on, on social media and it's th therefore the role of kind of social media companies or working with them to help unpick those those beliefs um, or stop them not unpick them stop them from spreading it's much easier to stop them spreading than once someone believes something believes something it's very difficult to dissuade them and there's quite a lot of research that suggests that things like myth busting can be actively kind of counterproductive um, in that space. So it's really about trying to nip it in the bud, basically. Okay, that, that's really interesting um, to hear. But I suppose there, there, there are some people who will be quite resistant, like regardless of what we do about conspiracy theories now. Do, does the panel have any advice on, on how to tackle them? Or are they 
are they not important to tackle at the moment because uh, there's so much that everybody could be doing, even those who are willing? Uh, Aaron. So I guess a couple of things there. I mean, I think I think this um, call has been a really useful one in thinking about the fact that it's not all about tax. When we think about trying to change behaviour, there are lots of parts that go into that. But the part that is tax is really just the, the financial cost for doing things. And in some sense, the more expensive you make things that we don't want people to do, the less people will do them. So to some extent, particularly at a point that more people, for other reasons, for other behavioural reasons, get switched over to thinking, well, I want to make the low carbon choice because that's also the socially nice things. All that, again, all that East um, that was mentioned by um, by Toby earlier. The more that you switch other people away from that, the more that one, you, you'll feel like the one odd weirdo who stands out as the, as the person who's not uh, kind of joining the programme. But also the easier it is to turn up the heat in terms of thinking, well, we can tax that behaviour even more heavily because it's really not the behaviour that most people are doing and so in some sense i mean in effect it's what we've done although it's because of habit it's hard but with, with things like smoking where the more that we've got people out of smoking the more that that as a syntax keeps going up uh, because you know most people aren't affected it's not a big political issue we find it much harder to increase alcohol taxes because you know the man or woman in the street is annoyed that their pint of beer has gone more, become more expensive and the average man or woman in the street does drink some beer or, or wine or, or equivalent but because most people are not smoking anymore we can increase that that tax on tobacco uh, and so there'll be a similar thing where over time as we make some of those choices uh, those default choices better and people more people are switching actually the tax system can do more and regulation can do more on those few holdouts effectively but i think it's again actually actually i think it's not the, the main thing for us to focus on right now currently most people are a long way from where we need them to be and so trying to have a system that gets most people in the right direction would be a big step in the right direction and then we can work on the on the holdouts effectively okay thanks very much we're we're running time so we're just going to take one final question from the audience which hopefully will be quite easy to um easy to answer because i think it does it seems like an obvious and a good thing to do um someone's written that um, as I understand it, the French have undertaken a massive training program for all civil servants across all departments on environmental issues. Is that a prospect here to influence policymaking across the board? Um, does the panel have any closing thoughts on that? I'll go to Lorraine first. Well, I'll start. I mean, I think that would be a great first step because I think that the House of Lords inquiry, for example, indicated that there are sort of knowledge gaps um, and skills gaps as well um, across the civil service uh, around well maybe not just climate change but also how to um, how to incorporate behavioral uh, to focus policies into what they're doing um, but uh, but we know that information and education by itself tends not to be enough to change behavior even within a also within a professional context so you'd need the institutional barriers to be removed as well and we've touched on the fact that you know there might be five year sort of periods that they're working to which limits the extent to which you can do anything long term or there might be just particular targets that are counterproductive to doing anything on climate change so those sorts of institutional incentives and the the, the the sorts of rules that they're working to would need to be overhauled as well I think. Okay thanks very much. Uh, Toby? I completely concur with that. Um, I think um... You know, what, one related point that's absolutely critical here is, of course, that government starts to lead by example. And so that can't be done with education internally within the civil service and government alone. That needs to be, as Lorraine says, through process. Um, we obviously, you know, the fact is that all policies go through Treasury. We do now have a department for net zero. But of course, the risk is that it remains siloed and it's just one other sort of um, spoke of government rather than acting as a hub. I think where we want to get to is a position where all policies go through some kind of net zero filter, just like it goes through a treasury filter. Absolutely, that's something that Green Alliance has called for. I'll, I'll come to Aaron and Max very, very quickly. Closing thoughts, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I think basically just agree with all of those things. So I think that the, the three-step program is closing that skills gap, then making sure that all policies have to be scored on, on a basis of, of climate. And that probably means having to go via the Department for Net Zero as the same way that you have to go through Treasury, you have to get kind of scored off and signed off by them if we're going to take this seriously. And then the third thing is, having done those things to actually have long term targets and short term targets, not just what we have in the Climate Change Act, but kind of short, medium, long term targets. So that when we're adding up kind of the, the effective policies, we're not just adding them up on an OBR scorecard, do we meet our declining deficit goal, but we're adding them up on an environmental scorecard, do we add them up and see that collectively that we're meeting our declining carbon goal. If we're not doing that, then the policy shouldn't be able to be signed off exactly the way we do for the budget uh, on, on a financial basis. Perfect. Easy. And Max, have you got 10 seconds? 
Yeah, the, the final thing I would say, and, and this might be the classic thing I'd say, but I think with all of this stuff, it's really just worth thinking also about the kind of public acceptability and recognising the kind of political motivations that are also going into these, um, into these and thinking really carefully about what how that's going to resonate because that is unfortunately going to be part of the decision making process and the more evidence that you can provide that not only will this be effective but it's not going to really annoy the general public the more kind of palatable it will, it will be thanks very much uh, an appropriate note to end on, I think. So, so all that remains to be done is for me to thank our panelists. It's been a fantastic event. You've shared some really, really invaluable insights. And to all the audience members, thanks very much for coming along, for interacting, uh, for, for sticking the course over your lunch break. And this recording will be available on Green Alliance's website. So please do uh, check that out and we'll share that with the attendees afterwards. So thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the day.